Kia ora everyone, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. Now today we're joined by Rod Duke, CEO of Briscoe Group. 84 stores throughout New Zealand, including Briscoe's Homeware, Living and Giving and Rebel Sport. So kia ora Rod, welcome. Hi there, good afternoon. Now you started your career in Australia, still in retail, but then in the late 80s you were enticed over to New Zealand. So why leave Australia? What convinced you to start a new chapter in your career over here? Um, I was at the end of a, a major project, um, which I just completed in uh, Sydney. Um, and I didn't have anything else special at that particular time. I was enticed by the then owner of Briscoe Group, um, a company called Hagemeyer, who were based in uh, Holland. And they asked me to come across and perhaps parcel the group up uh, for sale. They had owned the business for a large number of years. Uh, it was the furthest spot from uh, the Netherlands <clears throat> and they were ready to exit. So they asked me to come across, parcel up for sale and, um, and help them uh, um, you know, get rid of the business. Um, as it turned out, I, I came over for an agreed three years to undertake that. And um, then it was going to be fairly, it was going to be fairly lucrative if, if I if I made a success of it, and um, um, it turned out to be a little more successful than I thought. And I actually sold the business a year into that three year period <clears throat> to myself, um, and uh, and here I am, some thirty three years later. Well, yeah, I was going to say that that probably was a slight difference in plans there because <laughs> you, or at least your trust, uh, still majority shareholder in Briscoe Group now, but when you bought in, it cost you just $2, is that right? So talk to me about how that deal came to be. And was it one of those situations where the $2 was mostly symbolic? Um, yeah, it, look, it, prob it, it was. Um... It actually uh, cost me, I think, realistically, <clears throat> that year's bonus. So I swapped that year's bonus um, for 12 sets of keys um, and uh, three or four million dollars worth of debt. Um, so no, it did cost me a little more, but the two dollars was a symbolic um, share uh, thing because all the shares were at, a, at something like a dollar, and uh, you know I symbolically gave them a dollar or $2 for the business. But uh, you're right, it, it was a little more. But uh, look, why ruin a good story? <laughs> well, there's an interesting thought process behind that, right? So, you know, you come over and you're tasked with getting this business ready for sale and you're in charge of the business. And then you decide, you know what, I'm going to truly take charge of this business. It's going to be my business. What was the thought process like? And at what point did that idea start to germinate for you? Um, I arrived in this country <clears throat> in September 1988. Uh, by March 89, uh, I made the decision to sell the business to myself. Um, I had then uh, put the proposition to Hagemeyer. They in fact had agreed uh, with the uh, with the sale and purchase, uh, and in fact, it didn't take effect until the thirty first of December of that year, which was uh, nineteen eighty nine, because Hagemeyer, being a European company, they their financial year was a calendar year, and so the deal was struck on the as at the thirty first of December to take effect from January the first, nineteen ninety. So the deal was actually done after what's that six months. Uh, but didn't take effect until uh, the end of that year. So effectively, you know, I had committed to buy this business um, within six months of uh, landing in the country. What sort of pressure was that like? Because Briscoe Group actually has a longer history than I think many people realise. It started in the UK um, from what I've looked up in 1780 one which is incredible and then has been in New Zealand for over 150 years now so a lot of history there uh quite a big group did you feel pressure to step in as a buyer 
Um, no, the only pressure that I felt was that if I didn't do it, I might miss out on something special. So there was no, there's no pressure for me to do it. I simply had to parcel it up at that particular point. They were losing $2 million a year. I really just had to parcel it up, make it attractive for a potential purchaser, and then take a bonus and go back to Sydney. Um, so no, I, did, I didn't have any pressure. The only pressure that I really felt was that if I were to purchase the business, which I did, I would have had to get trading finance from a local bank, um, which I did. And so, sure, I had some big responsibilities, not just to paying off the debt, but also you know, we employed at that stage hundreds and hundreds of people. And so I had responsibility for a couple of hundred families for their livelihood. So, sure, there was some pressure to do it. But uh, I, look, I was pretty confident, as were a lot of the folks inside the business at that point in time, that it would be successful. It was really just a question of how successful and how long it would take us to, uh, to really get the, the company back on its feet and, and running fast. Mm. And one of those changes that you brought in, uh, it did take 11 years, 11 years later, 2001. You floated on the New Zealand Stock Exchange, um, although it's, I think, worth mentioning that you do still yourself control just over three quarters of the shares. So why take it to the Stock Exchange? What benefits did that bring the company? Yeah, we, we did take it to the Stock Exchange. We had intended to do it a, a year earlier, but of course the 9-11 um, the, uh, in the United States sort of stalled us for about, I guess, about six months. But, but why? Look, I've always been keen, as I, as I was then, to share the success of the business and therefore some share of the business with the people who build the business, the people inside this company. And so by going to the share market, it, it gave me two things. It gave me access to funds, uh, should I need them to expand the business rapidly, and it also gave me the opportunity to um, incentivize people inside the business by way of shares. And if they were listed uh, on the stock exchange, of course, they would have an intrinsic value and a, and a, and a, a value that everybody could calculate. Um, so that, they, were, they were the reasons. And, and they, look, they were valid reasons. And quite frankly, if I had my time over again, I'd, I'd probably do exactly the same. You're one of our most dominant retail brands now. I don't think that's a um, a controversial thing to say. Um, for a while, you were the number one. Of course, these things shuffle around, but for a while, you were number one in terms of market cap. Um, and some analysts have credited that to your Australian background, right back to the beginning, saying that the Australian retail sector, very competitive, and that you brought in some of the strategies that you learned there. So do you think, that's the case and are there any lessons that you think you brought back with you from Australia? Um, look, it is true. I, I, from the moment I left school at 16 years of age, I went into the retail business and that's the only business I know. So um, yes, uh, the Australian market is very, very competitive. Um, there are some different strategies that um, you know, we we adopted or we, we practiced in Australia that we adopted here. Um, the the market in New Zealand when I arrived in the country in 1988 was was very very um, new and a little different for me. And it it did seem to me that I was operating in an era just a little before. I actually got here. It, it, it just gave me the impression that the sorts of things that we were doing in Australia were just just a little bit uh, 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 different and nuanced to the sorts of things that we had to do here. Uh, and so, yes, I, I did revert back to uh, some of my Australian experiences and put some, uh, some newish things in place, um, one of which was Sunday trading. When we did that, we were the first major retailer to do that albeit illegally in the beginning, uh, but we managed to do that. We got away with that for about four to six weeks, <clears throat> but it was extremely lucrative uh, whilst it was illegal. Um, and um, yeah, it, it was, I have to say, it was really exciting. 
really exciting. It's exciting now, but in a slightly different way. Yeah. So give me a couple of examples of things that you think that you do differently now from other retailers that give you an edge. Um, well, the one most significant thing I think was, was the way in which we pitched the business in or, or the market position we dreamt about having when we sat down in late 1988 and with a small group of people, I said to the guys, uh, so to the to the uh, to the team, here is the market. And so I, as I normally do, I put up things in on butcher's paper all around the room. So I write stuff down so people could see it all the time. And I said, look, this is the market um, of homewares. It's all the way from department stores to cheap and cheerful um, two dollar shop style shops, of which there were uh, quite a few at that at that point. Some big names who were just selling the cheapest, poorest quality stuff right up to department stores. And we figured the best market position for us because I didn't want to compete down at the bottom end because I just happened to believe that there is always going to be someone else who who can find something cheaper and scungier than you've got. So I really don't want to compete down there. So I'd much prefer to compete up the food chain. And that is uh, real good quality, but real good price. Because back then in 1988, you could buy pretty good quality, but you couldn't get it at the right price. You know, it was always a very, very high price. And I didn't, as I said, I didn't want to compete down the bottom end because I, I just think it's, it's too too tough, you know. Mm. So that's the market position we aimed at. So today, um, Briscoe's has got brands like uh, all the famous portable appliance brands, the Sunbeams, the Brevels, the Brabantias, the Zips. It's got uh, all the Russell Hobbses and the Kenwoods and the KitchenAids and all those famous brands. We've got uh, Royal Dalton. We've got we've got a host of very very famous international brands, but because I don't pay three hundred dollars a meter in rent in some of the shopping malls, I pay less than half that in the places that I choose to have my shops. You know, it doesn't cost me as much to open the front door as it does some other retailers. So I'm now able to offer very 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 high quality merchandise. Okay, but at a real good price. And I think everyone aspires to do that. You know, rich people still want to buy high quality stuff. You know, even poor people, they want to buy high quality stuff as well. But sometimes it's just too damn expensive to do. So I think everyone, everyone's got to be in love with the concept of buying really good merchandise at really good prices. So that, that, was, that was where I was coming from. And you mentioned there about the brands that you've got, a lot of those really familiar, famous brands. And I yeah. think the other thing as well is, you know, when you think about um, your stores, Briscoe's, Living and Giving, Rebel Sport, those are also really familiar brands to New Zealanders. And to my mind, that familiarity seems quite key. You've also had, you know, Tammy, the Briscoe's lady, as the face of your stores since 1989, I believe. So yeah. could you ever get rid of Tammy now? You know, how important is it to have that sense of deep familiarity between your stores and New Zealanders? Um, look, I, I, I can't bear to think of the day in which I can't use Tammy. Um, we, we, we have a fabulous relationship. Um, we've been working together for 30 years. And she still looks as young and as beautiful as she did the day she started. Uh, so I'm hoping we can use her forever. Um, um, look, I, I, I can't begin to imagine. Look, in the future, Tammy may very well say, look, I've just about had enough. I want to have a bit of a rest and then we're going to have to find uh, someone else. But uh, hopefully that's a long way off. 
Yeah, I would like the name of Tammy's dermatologist, please. She looks amazing. <laughs> she does do a good job on herself, doesn't she? She really yeah. does. She yeah. really does. I don't yeah. think she's changed since I first saw her ads. No, no. <laughs> a, a very important question, which was sent in by a listener. Um, would someone be a fool to buy a Briscoe's item for full price? Uh, no, because our, our full price is, uh, is the price in the market. Uh, if you if you go and have a look at a Brabantia four slice toaster in uh, Briscoe's, it will be the same or a little cheaper than it is in a competing retailer. So, uh, no, it's just that you know, as I say, I'm not in shopping malls. I have to drive people to our locations. Because I'm I'm not in a shopping mall. I'm I'm very very rarely in the main street, so you have to. We are what we call destination. You need a real good reason to go there, um, and I can and I can afford to discount from time to time. Sometimes I I can't afford it, but I've just got to get rid of the stock, um, because I I'm saving money somewhere else. Yeah, it's interesting that, isn't it? So you're, you're saving on the overheads, and I know that that can be a real killer for a lot of retailers. I mean, let's dive into the numbers, because in your recent results for Briscoe Group, you did still get a healthy profit over the six months to, um, to July, 45.6 million. But within that, there was also a 3.9% decline in profit. Um and along with those results, um, you were talking to reporters, you said retail in general facing, quote, significant headwinds. So how bad do you think those headwinds could be? Is there anything you're doing now to try and respond to them ahead of time? Okay, let me double back on that uh, on that profit number. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the period I'm comparing it to was a period in which we were in and out of lockdown uh, supply chain was a bit of a problem getting stock. Um, and, um, you know, I had a lot of people off work. So what we did, we chose not to advertise and promote anywhere near as heavily as we had in the past because, well, there was no point in discounting, selling all the stock and not being able to get back into stock. And so whilst this period just gone, our profit is down 3.9% uh, or something, something like that. Um, it was compared to a period where the profit was the highest it's been in 150 years. So it was never, the profit was never going to stay at that particular number because that was just an extraordinary number. Um, so the, the slight dip in profit was not a big surprise to us and, and was forecast by us. Um, uh, so, uh, what was the second part of your question? Uh, in terms of when you talked about significant headwinds coming for retail, oh, what yeah, headwinds yeah. do you think coming? Okay, um, yes, th there will be. Look, look, there'll be the continuation of supply chain. Uh, even today, in some of our ranges, we might have toasters in five colours, but I've only got three colours in stock. There's also, uh, we've got uh, 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 salary increases. We've had uh, the cost of labour go up significantly. Um, we've got uh, interest rates, uh, housing interest rates. People I've noticed of very, very recent times are not feeling quite as wealthy as they did a year ago. Uh, why? I guess because the, the, the house price that they own is now, with the market now softening, is not quite as valuable. The cost of fuel to travel is now you know, quite a different price than what it was a year ago. Go down to the supermarket, I've just come out of a board meeting and one of my directors said, you ought to see the price of capsicums. Now, I don't, I don't shock myself, but that would resonate with a lot of people. Food and vegetables are, are significantly higher than what they were. And inflation is going to be running probably, you know, at a 10-year high once we start to get some of those numbers through. So I think in the suburbs, people are not feeling as wealthy or as secure or as bright about the future. And so what that does, it has a tendency from time to time to tighten up discretionary spending. So they're the sorts of headwinds that I think we um, 
are, are likely to experience in the near future. So as a retailer, how do you respond to that? Because that those are quite <clears> a few <throat> challenges and some fairly significant ones in there. Yes, you're exactly right. Well, I, I, I can tell you how we respond. I try and each eat someone else's lunch. Okay, so if there's 10% less sales available, because only 90% of the people are continuing to spend, then I try and steal someone else's lunch. And now that means that I promote more heavily, I do some other clever things in terms of my uh, online and the sort of things that we promote into the market. Um, look, your budget's always there, but sometimes you've got to do clever things to get it. And sometimes you have to steal it off someone else, another uh, one of your competitors. And so that, that's what we aim to do. Mm. And I'm just going to dip into some of the audience questions here because I think this one from Bill is is very good. I mean, the first half of his question you've you've pretty much already answered here, but I think the second part of his question is a really relevant point. So he said, "How have supply chain issues affected the business?" So we've talked about that, but has it been different for each member of the group? So has it been different across your stores? I think he means uh, the difference between the brands, between sporting goods and housewares. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, there has been some differences. Um, you would have noticed uh, for the last 12 or so months, uh, we've in deliberately increased the size of our inventories. We, we uh, foresaw that there would be some supply chain um, uh, difficulties, and we increased our stock by about 12 or $13 million uh, about 12 or 18 months ago. I'm currently carrying about $7 million more stock than we normally would. Um, and that's just in case some supply chain difficulties continue. So the, the, the first point I'd make is that we tried to cover our uh, shortages by increasing our average uh, uh, stock on hand. That's basically because of, uh, that's basically in Briscoe's. In Rebel, um, there hasn't, yes, there's been some shortages, but what we're experiencing moreover in that business, sporting goods business, is a delay of delivery. So we have uh, seasons, three or four seasons a year uh, within the merchandise assortments, and sometimes those seasons are only about 100 days, okay? Well, some of the deliveries have been 30 days late, which means now I've only got a 60-day season. So that in itself presents a bit of a problem, so it's those sorts of difficulties um, that I that I could highlight to you to uh, supply chain um, today and and even looking forward for the next maybe quarter or two. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned as well about you know the staffing issues and increased costs. You know we've heard a lot about the Great Resignation and how hard it is to find staff. I feel like when I talk to business leaders, that's often the number one thing they're bringing up with me. Briscoe's increased wage rates for the in-store team by seven percent in April and provided paid leave for COVID-related absences that was over and above existing entitlements. So. Are those changes a response to that great resignation trend? And also, is it working? Um, look, if I had a full complement of people, I, I would still uh, have um, put those sorts of things in place. I would still have paid um, uh, full salaries for uh, people who went home with COVID. Um, we still would have given back the... Um, the wage subsidies that the government put out. Look, at the end of the day, I feel a real responsibility to look after the families that that that, that work with us in this business. Um, look, we even cancelled a dividend to shareholders, I don't know, th three and a half years ago. You know, I didn't get one telephone call or one email from a shareholder saying to me, you shouldn't have done that. I've been here for six months. I expected a dividend. Why didn't you give me a dividend? You know, not one. So, you know, I get the feeling we're doing the right thing. We're looking after our people. 
Uh, am I am I short staffed? Yeah, I look, I love the government to, you know, start issuing work visas and these sorts of things because there's a lot of folks who want to work over Christmas, over holidays, and just want some part time work. And like the hospitality business done a lot of this, I am finding it extremely difficult, you know. And at the end of the day, I want to offer the best service to the customers who come in the shop. And it's, it can sometimes be really hard when the people um, are, are simply not available. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and we're going to have to skip to uh, audience questions now. Um, but so I will say to people, if you haven't dropped your question in, get it in under that ask a question <clears> button <throat> now because you will run out of time. And also um, upvote the questions that you want to make sure that we ask so that I know which ones to prioritize. But um, last one from me, just before we head into those audience questions, I mean, a lot of people <clears> are really worried about what will happen with the economy over the next year or so. So... Do you have any expectations of what you think will happen over the next year? And within that, you know, is there a highlight and maybe a low light? Look, for me, I'm happy to talk about uh, the next uh, six months out to the end of January, which is our financial year. Uh, and we have very, very high expectations. Um, yes, there are some headwinds. There's no question there's some headwinds. But remember, last half year, and that half year uh, for uh, those. Uh, viewers who don't understand our strange financial year, our financial year ends the end of January. So which means I started my financial year in August. So August to January last year, if you recall, Auckland, Northland and some other geographies were in lockdown. I calculated it out the other day that during that six month period last year, we lost 3,560 store trading days. Okay, so that's the number of stores multiplied by the number of days closed. Okay, that's what we lost. That is a power of, uh, of uh, period where I, I simply, I couldn't trade except online. And it's, you know, for some of the regions, your online business for that period was 100% of your sales. So we think this half year that we're in now, that's going to conclude in January, is for us going to be a very, very buoyant period. Okay. Now, beyond that, look, I, I don't know. Analysts have asked me exactly the same. And I've got to say, look, the caveat's got to be COVID. I'm not assuming for a moment that we're going to get another lockdown or another super spreader uh, variant. So with that aside, um, I think if I can write this year's number next year or a bit more, you know, I think that'll be a pretty good result. We, I've, I've got a terrific board of directors, but they don't like my profit going backwards. So I'm going to be moving heaven and earth, okay, to improve the profit um, and improve the sales, improve the number of stores we've got, the number of people we've got in stores, um, so that, that's going to be my target and uh, everybody inside this business is uh, incentivized on reaching targets. So we're going, to be, we're going to be going for it. So how do we feel? We're pretty buoyant about it. We, we feel pretty good about it. Mm. Okay, audience questions because we've got heaps um, and not so much time. Um, I'm going to combine a couple here, one from Tim, one from Dustin because they're both talking about online. So. Tim saying, how has online purchasing affected the business? Any new exciting developments in this area? And then Dustin, same, same, but different, saying, hi, how do you see new technologies positively or negatively impacting revenue or customer experience? Clearly, during COVID, the ability to facilitate online sales gave the group a distinct advantage. So, yeah, online selling. What's yeah, happening well, there? well, look, um, uh, like other um, uh, retail entities, I want to be an omni omni-channel retailer. So I'll sell in whatever way our customers choose to purchase. Um, in terms of new technologies, in terms of in terms of online for us, it's we found it's it's all about the 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 platform being stable, being innovative, being interesting to be on. 
easy to purchase from. If you have stock integrity, it's easy to deliver. It's even easy to tell people, I'm sorry, I can't deliver that, that product, and that's fine, you know? But I think it's all about the, the efficiency of it. Our current online business is running at around about 18 to 19% of total, um, of, of total sales. Um, is it likely to go beyond that? Well, look, look, it may very well, it may very well go beyond that. Um, but I just don't know at this particular point in time whether 18 or 19% is a little higher because of uh, you know, prior lockdowns or whether it's the new norm. Uh, but look, the questions are right. Uh, online's here to stay. Those of uh, our customers who hadn't adapted it quickly, I think probably did during lockdown. Uh, I'm sure some of them have had wonderful experiences and will return. Um, some of them will adopt um, click and collect. So, some people, perhaps in some categories, will still choose to go to the store because they want to. They want to try it on. They want to have a look at their their uh, uh, dinner set in the light. See see whether or not the colour on colour they see on screen is actually the real colour. Some of them who buy textiles, bedroom textiles or bathroom textiles want to feel it to make sure that it's that it is as soft and as lovely and you know as it as it as it could be so look it's going to be a, a bit of both depending on the category and depending largely on the customer but look i'm here to facilitate uh, whatever method a customer wants to purchase i'm here to facilitate that and to make the experience the most pleasurable experience so that so they come back to me do you have any plans in the works for changing, improving, bringing in new online options? Absolutely. Yeah, we, and you have to. Um, you, we're reformatting, uh, planning about the next platform change. You have to. It's, it's Look, it's a bit, a bit like a shop. You know, you have to have new, exciting stuff, different stuff happening all the time experience has to be easier, less seamless. It has to be really, really uncomplicated. And for that, you need technologies. And so, um, you know, if, if you're up to the game, not even ahead of the game, then you're planning the next change just before you implement the last change. Mm. So it's, 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 a, it's a real moving target. Interesting one here from Casey, who says, do you think Costco will impact business? Uh, my business? Yes. Um, I think it will interrupt uh, businesses, but not, not, ne not, not necessarily mine to the extent that a, a direct category um, competitor might. I haven't actually been out there, and I don't know precisely what they're going to sell. But as I understand it, if I have a look at the Australian, Australian experience, you know, they sell a vast amount of food and a vast amount of uh, petrol and a vast amount of liquor. Okay. Now, outside of that, will they sell a lot of <clears throat> uh, uh, dinner sets and irons and toasters and pillowcases? Uh, look, I suspect not, okay, but they might. Um, I'll have a better idea in uh, about 10 days time. Um, uh, but if the ranges are pretty well in line with where they are in Australia, no, no, I don't think they will. Mm. This one from Andrew, I guess, is um, fairly similar there because I, it's, it's always about keeping an eye on competitors, right? So um, from Andrew, what does Rod think Briscoe Group does um, that results in managing to exceed profit versus others that go down? Um, I, I, I look at my costs, the cost of doing business every single day. We are, if I go out and we rent a shop um, and you run into my landlords, you know, I don't like to overpay for anything. I don't, we, we uh, tender for our, the electricity, we, don't spend any more than 
10 cents on rent than I need to. Um, uh, uh, paper, I use both sides of the paper, you know. I, I, I'm really, really um, enthusiastically uh, uh, enthusiastic about, about not spending money unnecessarily. Because if I could do that and I could lessen my expenses, I can also take less margin, okay? So I don't, I don't have to charge more. So the experience of purchasing from us, um, you know, it's, it's, it's cheaper than it otherwise would be. Mm. All right. Now, this will have to be the last one, I think. Um, but how do you manage this one from Mark? How do you manage foreign exchange currency? Do you see the New Zealand dollar continuing to decline relative to the US? <laughs> Look, if I knew that, I'd be a banker, not a, not a shopkeeper who sells irons and toasters and pillowcases. But we hedge. I'm not a spot buyer. Okay, so I'm hedged out a year or more. Um, it scares me that uh, you know I can I can order merchandise to be delivered in two or three months, and um, you know the exchange can move either way. But fortunately, I don't pre-sell, so it doesn't actually cost me anything. Um, and what's my prediction? My prediction is that I don't know. And neither does my bank, and neither does my best friend's bank. Uh, I don't think anybody's got a clue where the currency's going. Um, so I hedge, I take no chances, and look, if it comes up heads or tails, I'm fine. You know, I just price and move on. Because look, at the end of the day, it's, it's neutral for me. It doesn't affect me more or less than the next retailer so except i i as i said i hedge out, i hedge out a year so i'm not exposed to any short-term danger it's fascinating stuff well we will unfortunately have to leave it there thank you very much for tuning in everyone and of course a big thank you to you rod for joining us really appreciate your time and your insights pleasure all right now dan brunskill back on hosting next week talking the kiwi dollar on that note uh so kiwi bank's chief economist jared kerr is looking at what's causing our weak currency what it means for importers exporters and investors whether it's likely to ever get its wings back so if you were interested in that last question do tune in a link to register for that discussion is in the chat right now enjoy the rest of your week guys do stay safe <laughs> Shizzies, shizzies.